So hi again, I'm going to talk to, to you about API Builder. My name is Dmitry Tansor, I work for Red Hat. I hope most of you actually know me. The slides, if you want to follow yourself, are on my website. Here is the link. And uh, the link is also in the Bermato Seek Etherpad, if you want to check it later. So let's start. RAM disk. Um, I hope all of you know why we use a RAM disk. We need to get into the machine to uh, conduct some operations inside of it like partitioning, creating images, and stuff like that. Um, most of you have not probably followed the whole history of our RAM disks, so let me tell you just for the fun of it. It started as a bash script that was injected in a draw cut of an operating system, and it only worked by exposing the ice as a shear and do some simple HTTP uh, calls. So it wasn't even a Ronic Python agent, uh, as I can understand that many of you can hardly imagine Ironic without Ironic Python agent, but there was time before that, and we had a pretty horrible looking bash script which kept growing, kept growing, and then uh, folks from uh, then Rackspace invented Ironic Python agent and proposed it to the community. That first was running on CoreOS, which was a different CoreOS from what you know right now. It was before acquisition by Red Hat, and it was pretty different even uh, based on a different uh, distribution. There was a Tarbo built from Debian, uh, which wasn't related to CoreOS. Uh, before that, it was even a container based on Debian that contained Ironic Python agent that was added to CoreOS as a payload. And yeah, it somehow worked. It was pretty resource heavy. And then CoreOS changed and we had to change ourselves. The third iteration of our RAM disk was Disk Image Builder, just build a normal operating system image, but pack it into a neat RAMFS. So instead of building a QCAL, just uh, zip it, uh, yeah, the CPIO plus zip or something like that. And the latest thing, the latest iteration was a small image based on tiny core Linux, which is a minimal Linux distribution. Um, the current state of things is like this. Uh, the first two no longer exist. Uh, actually, the bash script can still be found in this image builder sources if you are into history. The chorus one uh, is an IPA sources if you scroll back to mm, Newton, Mitaka, something like that. Um, the main production way to build ironic RAM disks is now um, Disk, through Disk Image Builder and Tiny Core Linux exist also for the purposes of our CI. The IPA Builder, what is that? It's a project uh, that appeared a few years ago by merging two things, two existing parts. First, we had uh, some scripts to build Tiny IPA, which is a Tiny Core Linux based IPA, uh, and it used to live directly in the IPA source tree. And we had an element, I'll explain what an element is, uh, to build a normal IPA image, and by normal I mean from a normal operating system, uh, that lived in this image builder itself, in its source tree. So we took this two and we created a new repo to consolidate all the tooling around building Ironic Python agent RAM disks. Um, first, a few words about tiny IPA, really few because I think most of you should not be using that. I know people are trying. Um, Tiny IPA was written for resource-constrained environments like CI or your DevScript, uh, sorry, DevStack VM or Bifrost VM. Uh, it can be built from Ironic Python Engine build directory by running these simple two commands. And it's based on Tiny Core Linux. It doesn't have many things you would expect. Like, I think CLS support is limited. And uh, more importantly, it doesn't have firmware for some hardware. And I don't mean exotic hardware here. I know some Dells have problems with Tiny APA. So be careful when trying it on bare metal. If it works, so great, but we designed it for virtual environments and cloud environments. Which brings me to the actual image. And I want to concentrate on it for a bit to give you an idea how it works and how it's built. More importantly, I'll talk less about how it works, but how it's built and how you, you can customize it. As I said, a uh, normal image is usually built from some real operating system. In the most simple case, you can invoke this command. Uh, the script Ironic Python Agent Builder is shipped with the Ironic Python Agent Builder repository. 
uh, providing with output dir and uh, well, the operating system you are going to use. Uh, it sets up Ironic Python agent to be started as a systemd service, uh, depending on networking being up. It installs all the required dependencies. It can support Ironic Python agent installed from source and from packages like RDO. And as any disk image builder um, element, and that's an element itself, it can be customized by further elements. So what's it all about? Disk image builder works by uh, taking a cloud image usually or an empty, uh, empty directory. It can use uh, things like a debut strap and so on. But in, in normal case, it takes a cloud image, uh, unpacks it uh, and starts running things in uh, truth and outside of it. So elements uh, have several stages. I've listed seven, there are more than that. I've listed the most important ones. They execute it uh, one after the other. So we start with extra data, which is usually used to populate some environment variables, pre-install, install, post-install, post -install, and then pre-finalize, finalize, clean up the... Uh, as you see, I marked some with a star. That means they run inside of truth. And there are a few of them, extra data, pre-finalize, and clean up that run outside of truth. So you can use something from your host operating system where you're building it. Um, for each state, each element, for each stage, each element has one or more scripts, usually bash scripts, and element can also declare dependencies on other elements. So from uh, deep runs stage after stage, as I mentioned, and scripts from each stage, from all element, are copied in one location, sorted alphabetically, and executed sequentially. So it's mixing. Uh, it's working not element by element, by, but stage by stage and uh, scripts from all the elements are mixed together. In this image builder, everything is an element. Even operating systems uh, are actually elements in this image builder. And I want to show you really quickly how you can write your own element to customize specifically Ironic Python Agent Builder. So I have this blog post. It's pretty long. It's about deploy steps, but a part of it is dedicated to building a RAM disk with a custom deploy step. So, um, as I said, element is a directory with files. Uh, it has a file that declares dependencies of the element, and each stage is a subdirectory that contains scripts. It can contain more, but in a simplest case, it's scripts. Uh, some elements uh, have configuration files. So, if you look here, um, by the way, let me know if uh, the font is too small. I can increase it further. Looks okay to me. Looks okay. Um, two dependencies, these are also elements. Uh, so we are writing a custom element that extends Ironic Python Agent RAM disk. So it, has, it, it should depend on Ironic Python Agent RAM disk. And it uses source repositories functionality, which is an element that comes with Disk Image Builder and can clone Git repositories. Um, so it, it looks for a configuration file inside of your element, which contains this magical line, which you can find, uh, you can find the explanation in the documentation of each element in the image builder. It's actually not so bad if you look at that. It contains uh, documentation for each element. So for example, we're looking at source repositories, so probably, yeah, there is something about it here. It's pretty nicely formatted. You can check everything in the image builder docs. Um, then we have our script that just pip installs the cloned uh, repository, and that's it. Um, when building with uh, your custom image with Ironic Python Agent Builder, as you uh, see here, I'm using a custom uh, custom location for a Git repository that's not required. More importantly, I'm providing an elements path with uh, my custom elements. And I'm providing a custom element as E flag. Uh, this works similarly with Disk Image Builder itself because Ironic Python Agent Builder is simply a wrapper around Disk Image Builder. Using Debian Minimal as an operating system and yeah, a few other things. The result of that are two files, kernel and init RAMFS, which you can use directly for your Ironic Python Agent Builder. Uh, sorry, for your Ironic uh, installation, back here. And that's pretty much 
what I wanted to tell you. Do you have any questions for me? Thanks a lot, Dimitri. Any questions for Dimitri? Dimitri, um, sorry, I was a bit late. Um, maybe you already covered it, but is, is part of this, this topic um, perhaps include describing um, strengths and weaknesses of various operating systems um, to host IPA? Oh, well, um, I don't think there are necessary strengths and weaknesses for supported operating systems. Um, I mean, if you're trying to use Arch Linux, you may have some troubles because it's not what we normally test with. Then the difference between main mainstream operating systems is probably marginal nowadays. I know from my experience that CentOS stream images are sub substantially larger than, for example, Debian images. And if you build and redistribute Ubuntu images, you can have problems with their copyright rules, specifically if you redistribute. But functionality-wise, they should be equivalent. So I, I asked this sort of from the perspective primarily of being a hardware vendor and wanting to actually execute this on bare metal. Um, so in terms of like bare metal support, um, drivers, you know, whatnot, um, that we could use um, for both our developer integration testing as well as in our CI. And so I'm just wondering, you know, if there's any guidance at all um, provided or sort of overview of all these sort of strengths, weaknesses, different aspects of the different operating systems available in our upstream documentation or on maybe uh, a wiki or, or some such place? No, not really. We're trying, in, in the upstream community, we're trying to be distribution agnostic to the extent that we support not all distributions, but we try to support all major distributions. And your question essentially boils down to which distribution supports your hardware better because mm -hmm. in the end, kernel models, firmware, uh, system deep stuff we all in, we inherit it from the base distribution it's not our own specific in any sense right and i understand that as a community we try to be os agnostic and i think that's where the challenge occurs for us as we try to find something that works well like any guidance that could be provided to assist not just us but i think other hardware vendors that try to stand up you know third-party CIs and try to do their work around developing drivers, this kind of guidance could be very helpful. And just to present it in a way, I guess, where we don't necessarily try to, you know, make a strong recommendation of one or another, just provide whatever is known uh, about them, strengths, weaknesses, different things to consider. I think that alone would be helpful in um, helping us decode all the options that are out there and which one might be the best fit without our having to do a R&D project to find the one that's the best for our needs and, and hence for the community's needs, right? Because I think the community benefits when we're more, more productive. I understand your interest, but I also don't think we should take any position on what is better and what is not, especially since we have Linux distribution representatives in the community and that can, Cause interesting issues related to this, related to this question maybe um do you have a feeling for what the main issues are that users have with uh, building images or i mean are, are they i mean is there is there feedback at all that um, or, or what's the most common issue that people have when they build their own images their own ipa images is it for me or for richard no it's for you okay I think the most common problem is uh, really not knowing what to do because um, especially if they need something, some customizations and I know a lot of uh, ironic uh, operators use extensive customizations or right. at least some hardware manager and people start uh, inventing ways for customizing ironic Python agent which are not necessarily optimal. For example, they start unpacking the resulting in gzip changing files and packing it back, which is not exactly a reliable way to customize that. And uh, as I showed today, there are much more, much nicer ways of doing that, like writing your custom elements, but this is not obvious at all. Right. 
and that probably is the biggest problem. But, but I guess that like the, the main element that um, users try to add is their own hardware manager, right? Right. Then there's also a question of minimizing the size of the image. That's a never ending problem. Right. You know, this, this was one of my next questions, like what, what are the issues? But for instance, I, I'm just looking at what we add, I mean, we, we of course have our own hardware manager, but we also have like some extra elements that we add, um, which I mentioned before, where we actually download things on the fly in the image, these kind of things. But I guess they like, hardware manager is probably the main, the main issue that people add. But do you think that the, si the size would be like, uh, I mean, this is a never ending story, but uh, you know, what is going to happen next with the size issue? Because people have hit this already. We have like removed some packages, but I guess there are limits to what we can do, right? Yeah, I'm afraid the operating systems are growing quicker than our expectations of the RAM disk size. Yeah. And with the migration of CentOS stream, we gained, I think, 100 megabytes and had to revert that because it wasn't acceptable for the CI. Right. I know that Debian images are smaller. I'm not sure why, honestly. Um, in Ironic Python Engine Builder, we take some measures to minimize the size. Like we remove documentation, we remove certain things we know we don't need. Mm -hmm. I'm really sad we cannot remove Git because Git is like pretty heavy. It's yeah. I don't know, 20 megabytes or something or 30 megabytes. Um, I had to like force remove it. So I'm downstream, I'm building a minimal container with Ironic Python agent that I had to force remove Git from there because otherwise it wasn't minimal. Do we actually know what the maximum size can be? Well, I mean, there's, is there some kind of hard limit where we know, okay, that the, the kernel addressable, addressable space is like this and this is like the maximum you can have? I think that would be interesting, interesting to know because then we could check for this as well. So there are some limits on that, and we've seen a person hitting that, but then they used a different grub bootloader or something like that. So you can check the mailing list. There was an interesting story around that. In practice, I know that, well, Triple used to have pretty large uh, RAM disks, maybe like 700, 800 megabytes, mm -hmm. that order of magnitude that still worked on all reasonable hardware. Right. I checked the other day, I was just like 600 something, the maximum, because we, I, I was debugging something and I had a 400 megabyte and someone was saying, yeah, well, your render is just too large, but I had, a one, I had one that was 600 and was still working, so that was not the issue. But yeah, I, I've not gone much further, further than this. Yeah, I've spent some time on that, but uh, yeah. that's, uh, that has to be a repeated exercise and I don't always have time for it. Right. Um, I very much liked, changing topic now, I very much liked the history because of, of course I was not aware at all on, on one of your very first slides. Um, the very first iteration, when you said like there was a bash script injected in Drawcut, can you expand a little bit on how that worked? Because this basically, I mean, this is like, it's a bash script that's in the init RD or? When you said, like, yeah. Okay. So you can customize Drawcut. Drawcut is an init, RAM, init RD builder for right. many distributions. You can customize it with your own bash script. So it wasn't like a normal system D service. It was uh, because what we do with initRAMFS now is a bit weird. We use initRAMFS not only for literally initRAMFS, but we actually have system D services there and stuff, which is the way distributions work nowadays. Yeah. But Drakat runs earlier and it's a bunch of bash. I'm look, I'm I may even try to find that for you. Even though I think they still have this element, uh, it was called something simple, but maybe maybe they've removed it already. Mm. Yeah, maybe they removed it. Unfortunately, I also don't remember how it was called. Uh, so, but yeah, it was pretty much a large bash script. It was uh, run in the boot sequence. This Drawcut run this Drawcut network? Yeah, it wasn't exactly that. But okay. Never mind. I was just, I was just wondering. But this, like, of course, offered like limited functionality, I guess, right? This was like 
very limited. So just to get an impression, uh, that thing did not even have an ability to run SSH. So I tried to use SSH to debug it. It, I, it did not have the users bootstrapped correctly. Even the root user wasn't really bootstrapped. So, th so that login could not happen yeah. on that RAM disk. Yeah, I haven't thought about this. I guess that like debugging this was quite a nightmare. Debugging that was indeed a nightmare. Because, because so now I, whenever, whenever I have to like debug the IPA, I mean, it's basically booting up, you use SSH to log in and just like <laughs> poke around. So it's quite, quite easy. Right. Um, okay. Nowadays it's easy and you have like normal systemd services that can have dependencies right. and what's not. Uh, before that, it was a bit <laughs> sad. Okay. Is, is the IPA builder missing some functionality? Like, I mean, is there, is there some like big thing that is still missing or is that actually like complete and does everything it needs to do? Uh, it's complete. It's actually a wrapper around this image builder. So whatever this image builder can do, you can do with that. Or you can just uh, skip it and use this image builder directly with the elements we provide. So I found a bash script if you're interested. I checked out the tag 100 uh, zero, zero from this image builder. And there was this bash script. So see this boot, bootloader installation, vendor password support, <laughs> uh, ironic URLs, root some primitive root device detection, uh, SCSI deploy, which we need removed recently. Oh. <laughs> so that was the deploy. The, that was the RAM disk. That's, that's the entirety of it. That's, that's yeah, it. I forgot I was just saying, let's go back to the best way. I was thinking the same thing. It basically has everything you need. <laughs> yeah, that's grandfather for ink Python agent RAM disk. Yeah, but it has, basically, it has really basically everything. If you go to the very bottom, I mean, it, it downloads the image. Uh, no, it doesn't download the image. It's, it uses iSkyZ to play. Ah, it's really, okay. It's really, it's it's, yeah. Starts iSkyZ target, then it stills Ironic uh, through vendor pass rule uh, because we didn't have RamDisk API at that point. So Ram uh, vendor pass rule that we are uh, ready, wait there, and then stop the iSkyZ target and stores bootloader. So there's not much here. Uh, cleaning was not a thing back then, if you're curious. So cleaning did not exist. So there's no clean steps, of course. But I, I recognize some, like the, the part that where you've just been, like right before installing the, group lo the, the, the bootloader, there's something that looks very similar to what we still have in Grub install, like mounting um, devs and proc. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it looks, I mean it's all inherited from here. You know this part of the code, it actually looks very similar. Some code has made it. <laughs> nice. Are there any more questions for Dimitri? Am I still online? Do you still hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear okay. you. Are there more questions? Just speak up if you have any. So the element is deploy ironic if you don't want to do some archaeology. <laughs> so I guess, Dimitri, you mentioned size being a challenge. Are there any other challenges that you see um, with uh, IPAs that are built? Not really. I mean, uh, rebuilding it uh, is a challenge. Debugging it can be a challenge, and size can be a challenge. And I guess also device support, right? Just sort of out of the box, what kind of support there is for various devices? Right. Is that, we, is that ex fair? We expect that we support whatever the underlying operating system supports. Mm. Yeah, this is something that I, I also brought up the other day, which is that um, if you have aging hardware and the operating system that you use for the IPA um, drops drivers, like CentOS 8 does for some disk drivers. Um, I mean, it's not related directly to the IPA builder, of course, but this may be challenging. You see what I mean? So if you have like, a, like an, an IPA image that's built on the newest release of an operating system, but the operating system doesn't have support for the drivers anymore that you have, then you have to go back to some older image, which may not work in your environment anymore. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we often run into a similar but different issue where we, we get a pruned down operating system that has very minimal mm -hmm. um, support for devices. And then we find that the support we need for a device that's common today in newer systems is not available. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It just becomes, it sort of becomes a uh, you know, black hole trying to get something that'll actually work um, against our actual bare metal. 
Right. And that's my that's my concern. That's sort of the, the reason why I raised it is that well, it may not have anything to do directly with disk image builder or IPA builder. Um, but with the IPA image in general. The, the result of, of that activity is right. often not usable. And that's where that's when the fun begins. And so any any guidance to help us, you know, make reasonable choices to get us on the right trail mm -hmm. would be helpful. And, and I and I think this gets exacerbated by perhaps UFI and virtual media and other such things. So I, I don't know if Dimitri, if you found anything that that um becomes sort of challenging in those in those environments, UFI and virtual media. Um yeah, we, like every, everything is possible. Uh, we have some issues, but not with our Python agent right now when we cannot always boot U, UFI with UFI on some machines. But yeah, it's again, when you think specific to our Python agent or the way we build it, except for you have to have some spare RAM because the image is quite large. Yeah, and I think generally, though, I mean, I, at least in the systems that we that we integration test against, there's usually no shortage of memory. We're, um, mm -hmm. you know, we're we're pretty, we're not real conservative. We 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 buy what we think we need. Um, we happen to benefit from having plenty of hardware, but we do find we do find that sometimes it, it's low on memory, especially UP, and I think virtual media. We've seen that in the past. Yeah, virtual while. media. Virtual media can be interesting. For example, I know there is some not really popular hardware that has 150 megabytes limit on virtual media. IPA won't fit there. Right. And maybe maybe we've encountered that in the past. Um, hard to say. It's been a while since I've seen it myself, but it, I have seen it in the past. Yeah, with virtual media, another problem, again, not IPA specific, specific to any virtual media is uh, hardware differs in how they treat virtual media. So this 150 megabytes limit comes from the fact that they don't load it completely first. Some hardware don't load it in batches. Some hardware don't load it on every access with pretty small buffer size. And yeah, that can be a problem. So I, I guess what I'm getting to is, do we have a way of like sharing these learnings amongst members of the community? You know, these things that we learn that maybe not, they're not directly related to the tool, but certainly with the thing that's produced by the tool and its usefulness. That's what I'm sort of, that's what I'm interested in, Arne, from, from yeah. the perspective of the special interest group is, you know, sharing our learning so that we could be more productive and, and get, get to know what we're. Yeah, exactly. This is what I was asking if we know what the limit is. So if you have like built an image that is like, I don't know, three gigabytes in size, you won't, you, you know that this won't work because it's too big, but I'm not sure I know what the exact limit is. I don't know if, if this is like hardware dependent, for instance, uh, or Probably. like like firmware version dependent, or I mean, I don't even know on what this depends. Right, and we may not know, and it may be just sort of guesses based on what we do know, right? So, you know, I've, I've tried this, and this is my configuration, it's the firmware, and I found that this the size didn't work. Not sure what the cause is, but you know, here's, that, here's what I've seen. So something like this, something like a knowledge base may be sensible to do. So we have something like for our deployment, for instance, because we just, well, just uh, like two years ago, we, we switched most of the things to UFI. Uh, and of course, this has created some, some issues. So we have like uh, a list of errors that are sometimes cryptic to understand to actually know what does that mean. So when your node displays some error message and it's something cannot move forward because of something, uh, what does that actually map to? Uh, and, and sometimes this would probably be sensible to have. So if you, if you run into something like, I cannot, al cannot allocate memory on like very early stages of the boot, what does that actually mean? Has that to do with the, with the run this, yes or no? Or um, I, I think something like this would be good, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Those, are the kinds of things I'm, those are the kinds of things I'm referring to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. any, any, any information at all or guidance would be helpful based on other other members of the community's learnings. I don't think we have such a like knowledge base or place to share. Uh, we have turbo shooting guide in uh, our admin docs. Yeah, maybe it's something we should add there. I mean, I can like put some of the stuff that we have there. I mean, of course it's like, I mean, for the, for the examples that I just gave, um, this is probably like very hyper 
dependent or a firmware version dependent because the error messages probably, but it, it, at least it gives you some ideas what to look at. Like, uh, okay, is there an issue with the, with the image because it's like broken or is the image too big or um, is there something wrong with my TFTP server or these kind of things. So we have like, I don't know, 10 or 12 different error messages that we decoded over the past couple of months to actually understand what they really mean and what to, what to fix. That's yeah, ironic that we have to deal with all these uh, bare metal challenges. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's very hard to help us. 